Okay, so I'll make sure that we cover that as well. Well, okay, let me start by doing some basics on that. Let's talk about what that t-test really is. Okay, and, and you know, I also have posted on YouTube for another class, kind of a rundown on it, kind of similar that I'm doing now, kind of a quick and dirty view of what the t-test is. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post that on our Blackboard as well. Okay, let me see here. Am I plugged in? Nope. Get my tablet working. Okay, still not quite there. There we go. Okay, good. I'm, I'm in business. Okay, so let's let's think about this. First thing we learned learned about was a normal distribution. Not working so well for me here. Normal distribution. Hmm. Let's see what the problem is here. Maybe the surface is a little dirty. Normal distribution. Okay, that's as good as it's going to get, I guess, today. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, that looks something like this, right? And what's the property that, that very many things tend to distribute themselves normally? Um, most of the values are somewhere around the middle. Fewer and fewer values are further away from the middle. And then you get people that people or uh, subjects or numbers or, or outcomes that are further and further away from the middle, but they're less frequent. So we know that like, you know, this could represent a binomial distribution, this kind of shape. Um, in some cases, it could represent yeah, like human measurements, like blood pressure. Most people are around the average. Fewer and fewer people are unusually low and usually high. Well, we learned certain properties of this. We learned that 95% that we could define the nature of this normal distribution by basically two parameters, its mean and its standard deviation. Now, use mu and sigma because they're parameters, they represent a population. This is all the people in the population. So, so if I know what, me, what mu is, I know where the center is. If I know what sigma is, I know how spread out this is. So another distribution, normal distribution with a larger sigma and the same mean might look something like that. It's just the middle's in the same spot, but it's spread out more. But in both cases, I can expect 95% of the outcomes or 95% of the values to be within two standard deviations of the mean below and above. So notice that two standard deviations in this case is closer together than it is in this case, right? So that's the way normal distributions work. Well, now a lot of times we're in, this, we're, we're in a situation where we don't know what mu and sigma are, right? So we're dependent on X bar and the standard deviation. I can call it S or SD, either one. These, because I'm not using Greek letters, we know that these are statistics. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get to the t-test very quickly. So I'm going to introduce this a little bit. So in the so when we're dealing with samples, if if I take repeated samples, that is one other there's one other thing we need to know about the um, uh, uh, when we take a sample, which was not relevant to the population, and that's the size of the sample. Okay, and what happens is, is that if we take a sample from a population, from this population, let's say, and we take that, we find the mean of that sample, and then we keep doing it over and over again, and make a new distribution from all those sample means. I know I get a normal distribution also. In fact, not only that. But even if this is skewed a little bit, the the sample size uh, it will itself be normal, even though the original population might be skewed a bit. Okay, and this works better and better as the sample size gets larger. So now, for a sample size of say say sample size is equal to a hundred, right? Big, pretty big sample size, right? Uh, the sample size is equal to a hundred. What's going to happen is is that this sample now <laughs> is going to have a mean that approximates mu, right? X bar, X bar, X bar on top is going to be approximately equal to mu, 
Okay, we don't know, what, since we're taking a sample, we never really know what the mean is of the population, but we're hoping that we get pretty close, right? Because you would re imagine if you take random samples from this population, half time be less than me the mean, half time more than the mean, so eventually you'd wind up with something that's normal as well. So now, uh, now the way that this is distributed, well, instead of a, a sigma, we're going to use the standard deviation, SD, right? The way that this is distributed, Right now, again, 95% of the samples you take, sample results that you get, are going to be between one st two standard deviations below the mean and two above the mean. Now I'm going to I'm going to re refine that a bit. It's really not two; it's 1.96 standard deviations below the mean and 1.96 standard deviations above the mean. <clears throat> if that's 95%, that means that 2.5% of the outcomes will be lower than that number, and 2.5% of the outcomes will be higher than that number. We call that two-tailed, right? If we were going to if we we're going to if we we're going to do the same thing one-tailed, it would look like this: all 5%. This is 95% of the outcomes. All 5% would be up here or down there, either way, but just one of the two. So now it's 5%, so that value would be 1.64 standard deviations from the mean. Let's not worry about that too much right now. We're almost always going to be working two-tailed. Okay, so, so the thing with this is, is that the standard deviation of the population, see, uh, of, the, uh, of all these samples, of all these samples, uh, 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 well, I don't know what it is because I have to take many samples to find it out. Okay, but the way that many, many, many samples, in other words, uh, all the samples you could pop possibly get to actually know what it is for sure, or know what sigma is for sure. Okay, but we're not in that situation. So we have to estimate this standard deviation of the samples from what we know about the, the uh, uh, sample that we took. Well, the sample that we took, we know X bar. And we know the standard deviation, but we don't know the the distribution of the sample means. Okay, and that's called the standard deviation of the samples, or we give it a new name, the standard error. So where the, mean, the population is concerned, we know x and we know mu. Where the populate where the samples are concerned, we know x bar. Uh, we estimate x bar based on our sample. We estimate uh, the standard error based on our standard deviation of the sample that we took and the sample size that we have. The bigger the sample size that we have, the more accurately we know the standard deviation and narrower is the uh, standard error. And we calculate that. Usually, if we know if we knew what sigma was, it would be equal to, if, if we knew what sigma, if we knew that what that was, then the standard error, the width here, the number of standard errors apart that we would use, 1.96, that actual number would be equal to sigma over the square root of the sample size. The bigger the sample size gets, the smaller this number gets. Okay, now we don't often know what sigma is, so we have to instead substitute the standard deviation that we know from our sample over the square root of n. When we do that for a very large sample size, we treat it as if we know what sigma is, and we and and. Uh, <coughs> So that we know what sigma is. When we have a small sample size, say, you know, certainly less than 30, you know, maybe even less than 100, right? Uh, so you'll see various rules for this. But if you have a small sample size, instead of using 1.96, we have to make up for that uncertainty because they, uh, our distribution is going to, our distribution of these samples is going to be wider. We have to make up for that by using a number larger than 1.96, okay? And that is determined by something called a T distribution, okay? And you're gonna go to a table and it'll tell you what value of T that you have to use instead of 1.96 for 95%, right? What value you have to use of T instead of 1.96 based on the sample size, okay? It really, it really uh, lists it according to degrees of freedom, which is just simply the sample size minus one. So that's where we're that's where we are. We have to, in order to uh, make up for the fact that our sample is a good guess at what the population looks like, we have to use very frequently, unless it's a really big sample, right? We have to use 
the T score instead of the Z score. Well, why do they call it a T test? The reason why they call it a T test is if I if I draw this distribution, right, my T distribution, right, and uh, the middle of my sa my sample comes out to be, excuse me, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to do this a di slightly different way. See if I can get this to go away. That won't work. Okay, so I'm going to get myself a new page. Okay. Now, let's say I find that my mean, my, I take a sample, sample of 25 people, and my mean X bar is equal to 120. Let's say it's weight of females um, uh, from uh, uh, age 18 to 25, right? Let's say it's 120. Let's say the standard deviation of my sample, remember this is, I'm getting the standard deviation from only 25 people. Say standard deviation of my sample is equal to, uh, let's say 10, 10 pounds. Okay, so now I say to myself, okay, you know, that if I assume, what this looks like, it looks like a population that might look something like this. You know, I really don't know, but I'm gonna maybe 120, and then 95% of the people are between, uh, are somewhere between uh, these two values, and if I had to guess, maybe about 100, 140, somewhere in there, right? But that's the population. I really want to understand how my sample is behaving, right? So how accurate is my sample now? Well, now, what I want to know is, what's the, if I took repeated samples, how much would they vary from this 120, these repeated samples? Okay, so I said to myself, well, let's see. I need to find the standard error, the standard deviations for sample, 20, samples of 25 taken over and over again. So what's that going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to sigma over the square root of n. We don't know sigma, so instead of sigma, we have to use s. And, and that's and it's still over the square root of n. So sigma was 10, and the square root of n, n was 25, square root of 25, so it's going to be 10 over 5 is going to be equal to 2. So my standard error is equal to 2. What that tells me is, is that my distribution, let's say that I got it right on the nose, that it was 120. Right? What that tells me is, is that if I took samples of 25 over and over again, I would expect them to be between 1.96 standard deviations below 120 and 1.96 standard deviations above 120. Okay, and and standard error, standard errors rather. Standard error is, is two, so two times 1.96 would be approximately three point so on and so forth. So I'd expect them to be about 116 to 100 and uh, 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 100 and um, um, uh, four, I'm adding to the right, 24. Between 116 and 120, that's what I would expect 95% of my samples to be. Well, there's a problem. I took the standard deviation. I use the standard deviation as sample instead of knowing the population standard deviation. Okay. So, so oh, thanks. I, I appreciate the help while you're doing that. Okay. So, at any rate, so I expect it to be within that range. Now, the problem is I didn't know the population standard deviation, so I used the sample standard deviation instead. So now, instead of 1.96, my T distribution would require me for a sample size of 25, in other words, the, the distribution that represents that sample size, that would require me to move my goalposts. It would, the distribution would be spread out a little bit more. So it would cause me to move my goalposts out further right? How much further? Well, we go to a chart to figure out how much further we got to be. The aggressive, the T-chart. It's not aggressive. Aggressive is just the name of the book that I took it from. So don't call it aggressive T-chart in another class. It's actually just the T, T distribution. Okay, so how do I do this? 25 degrees, 25 sample size, 25. We use 24 degrees of freedom. That's the way they display it. And that score now, that instead of 1.96, now notice this is for 90%, 95%, 99%, etc. We're using 95, so I'm going to go down to 
24 degrees of freedom, and it's 2.064. Okay, so instead of using 1.96, I would use the value 2.064. Okay, so this value here then would be 2.064 times uh, uh, the standard error 2, subtracted from 120, and added to 120. You guys probably remember we call that the margin of error after we multiply it by the t of the z-score. Okay, so that's how I would find my 95% confidence interval. Well, now let's say that I do this. Let's say I did this. This is exactly the result that I got for a... <coughs> so now I'm just... Now it's going to be 115 point... Uh, I'm going to do this quickly. Just call it 115.8 to 124.2 or something like that. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it like that. So now, so now, let's say that I take this sample from a population A, and I want to compare it to the mean for population B, right? Well, in population B, I know the mean of the entire population. So let's say that the mean of that entire population is, the mean is of B is equal to 125. Well, how often, how likely would it be that I would get a sample, uh, if I took a sample from population A, right, who I don't know, I don't know what the mean of population A is. So how, how, based on this result, how likely would it be that I would get a value as high as 125 from population A, if it really had a mean of uh, uh, that we started with, right? If it's really 120 and the standard deviation, I, I did this and so on and so forth. How likely I would get, would I get a result like this if it was really a mean of 125? Well, we would only get that result less than five, less than less than five percent of the time. In fact, we'd only get a result higher than that, less than two and a half percent of the time, right? Because it's going to be outside of this range up here, 124.2, right? How about if it were a mean of um, uh, uh, 120? <coughs> Excuse me, a mean of, not 120, a mean of uh, 115. Well, again, 115 would be outside of this 2.5% uh, on the bottom. So less than 2.5% of the time, I would get an outcome that far to the left or that far to the right. Okay, now... Really, since I'm starting, I don't know if I, when I started, whether I was going to get a sample that was bigger than 120, uh, than the population B mean or smaller than population B mean. So I say to myself, okay, I'm going to reject the idea that population A equals population B. I'm going to reject that idea if it's either lower than or higher than. So if I don't start with an assumption about whether it's higher or lower than, which we don't like assumptions too much, right? If I don't start with that, well, then I got to reserve 2.5% at the top, 2.5% at the bottom, right? So that's really, I'm I'm willing to, to have a 5% chance, 2.5% chance that it's lower, 2.5% chance that it's higher, 5% uh, chance of being wrong if I say that they're different. The reason why it's a 5% chance that I could be wrong is because it is possible to get this outcome that when it's less than less than 115 when it's uh, less than 115 or greater than 124 it is possible to get that outcome it just doesn't happen very often it happens less than 5% of the time in these situations now if if it turn if actually the mean of b was equal to 122 right well you know that would happen over here that could happen as much as maybe 10% of the time, right? So it can happen too frequently for me to take that risk. So what I've done here is I've done a single sample t-test. I've compared what I know about the sample that I took to a known mean. I, so it's a single sample because there's one sample involved and it's being compared to a set value. Another way to do the t-test is to say that t is equal to it's equal to x bar. I can put a bar right. You know, I keep. I'm getting in the habit of putting bar next to it when I when I'm writing. I do it on a uh, computer uh, when I'm typing because it's simple. 
you know, it's easy to do. X bar minus mu, the difference between these two, in other words, 120 versus 125, let's say, the difference between those two over the standard errors. In other words, how many standard errors apart at 1.96, 2.51, 2.064, how far apart are they? So the T score in this case, if this if the mean were 125 and, and our sample the 120, the mean in this case, the, the, the X bar minus mu in this case would be 120 uh, minus 125 over, <clears throat> over the standard error, which was 2, right? So what is the mean in that case? The, mean, the, the, the T value in that case, the T value in that case is equal to 2.5, okay? Okay, so we use the T distribution because of a sample. Yes, exactly right, using the T distribution because of the sample size. If you had a, a sample size of 100 or 200, maybe you would use just plain 1.9, 1.96. Okay, so, and that's even, that's a judgment call. Uh, if you look here, yeah, it, it doesn't really become 1.96 until you know the entire population. Right? It's always a little bit bigger. So your sample size of 100 is really close. But it, it, you know, as, they say in, in, uh, as they say, close is only good in horseshoes. Right? So, so, uh, so what uh, SPSS or other software like it does, it always uses the T-value. Even if it's a sample of, of say, a 1,000 sample size, it would use a T-value anyway. It might be so close it's ridiculous, like the 1.9601 or something like that. Right. So, you know, but it still uses it anyway because it's the calculation is built into it. it. Doesn't need to go to a table. So, okay. So now the T value is 2.5. What does that tell you? That tells you that that the difference between these two means puts it so far two standard deviations, two standard errors away from the from each other. Okay? So, it's, now we know that the the T value that we saw that we needed for five for five percent chance of error, right? The T value that we saw for a five percent chance of error was equal to two point oh six four. So the T value we calculated is bigger than we need to say that they're different with ninety five percent certainty or less than five percent chance of being wrong, right? You could say it both ways: ninety five percent confident, or you could say not 5% chance of being wrong if you say that they're different. They call that an alpha error of 5%, 0.5, 0.05. Okay, so so in this case, that what we're doing is we're looking at the difference between the two of these in terms of standard errors and checking against the T value that we need to be bigger than to be have less than a 5% chance of being wrong. Okay, so now what comes up now is is that, you know, often... <laughs> We don't know the mean of either group that we're testing, right? So in that case, we're doing a sample from both groups. So when we do that, we're doing X bar from group A, and we're doing X bar from group B, right? So then we have a sample size for group A. We have a sample size from group B. We have a standard deviation from, from group A. We have a standard deviation from group B. Okay, so now what are we going to do here? Well. You know, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to tell how far apart they are in terms of standard errors. Okay, so in a two-sample t-test, what we're doing is we're going to say, okay, x bar a minus x bar b, right? The, the difference between the two means how far apart are they? But we want it not. We're not that interested in it as as an absolute value. We want to know how far apart they are in terms of the standard error. And we're going to calculate a t-score for that, right? So now we have to say to ourselves, well, the only problem with that, how do I calculate standard error? Before, the way I calculated standard error, I said it's sigma over the square root of n, right? I don't have sigma. I don't have the population standard deviation. So which of these should I use? Well, now we get into some shaky territory, don't we? You could look at this from a couple of perspectives. One way is you could say to yourself, <clears throat> this one is very close to this one. And I think, in fact, the two of these uh, are really, even though the means may be different, the variability might be the same in the two groups. So when we when we say that, we say, let's do, a, if it looks like the two standard deviations are equal, we calculate a pooled 
standard deviation, right? And, and, and that pooled standard deviation then is used to calculate our standard error. Okay, I'm going to put that down. I'm, just, I'm not going to do the calculation here. I'm just going to do that. Well, how about the sample size? Well, if we assume that they're the same, we're going to pool them. The sample size, we just add the two sample sizes together, N1 plus N2, and subtract 2, N minus 1, in both cases, right? So that's the way that we deal with the, uh, uh, excuse me, N1 plus N2 is this new sample size. Minus 2 gives you the degrees of freedom, right? So that's how we get our degrees of freedom uh, to f figure out what our T value has to be, and that's how we figure out our standard error. The formula for, for calculating the standard error is a bit complicated. I'll show it to you on a form that I gave you in the last class. Okay, I'll pull that up in a moment. Okay, so the standard error, we need to calculate, right? So uh, we, if, they're the, if these are the same, we pool them, and this is what we do to get the degrees of freedom or the total sample size. So, <clears throat> so now, um, that sounds pretty good if, if these two are close. But now, so now, this is, this is what we do with equal variances. Right, and variance is another word for the standard deviation. Actually, standard deviations derived from the variance. Okay, so what do we do if they're very different? If the standard deviation, if the standard deviation of group A is like ten, and the standard deviation of group B is more than double that one, like say forty, ten and forty. Well, I really can't say that they're the same, so I don't want to pool them, so I handle them differently. So in that case, in the case of the uh, that they're not, the variances are not equal, right? Well, we do exactly the same thing with the T-score, X bar A minus X bar B over the standard error, except now we calculate our standard error differently, okay? And I will get to that when we get to the uh, 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 actual result there. And our degrees of freedom now, now remember these might have the same sample size, they might have different sample size. Our degrees of freedom becomes very complicated, the formula for that becomes very complicated, and I'll show you that in a second, right? So our degrees of freedom is what we go, what we use to go to find out what our critical value of t is that we have to exceed, and our standard error is based on uh, calculations that involve our standard deviations of the two samples and the sample size of the two samples. We'll see that formula momentarily. So that is if the variances are not equal. There's one more uh, situ. There's two more situations I want to. Preview, preview for you that are going to come up. Okay, and one situation is that, let me just check something here. Good, we're good there. And that situation is, okay, that situation is when we have paired samples. Okay, and what are paired samples? Well, you know, sometimes you might, for instance, you might say to someone, uh, um, 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 I'm, I'm in and out of Weight Watchers like, you know, every two years, every two or three years. I don't go to meetings. I hate the meetings, but, you know, I'll, I'll kind of follow their program a little bit for a couple of years. But let's say you want to test how effective a weight loss program is, right? So you take subject number one, subject number two, subject number three, subject number four, subject number five, and you take those five people and you weigh them when they start, okay? Let's say 150. Uh, 200, 125, uh, 135, 140, okay? You weigh them when they start, and after about three weeks, you weigh them again, three weeks down the road. Okay, so let's say this person weighs 140, this person weighs 180, this person weighs uh, 120, this person went the opposite direction, they're up to 140, this person didn't change at all. So, the differences between these, right, there's, there's two ways you could look at this. You could look at them as if they're individual people, right? Like this was group A and this was group B. But, you know, you have a lot more power if you look at them as individuals that changed rather than two different groups of people. So what you can do there is you can look specifically, did this particular person lose or gain weight? So in this case, they lost 10 pounds. In this case, they lost 20 pounds. In this case, they lost 5 pounds. In this case, they gained 5 pounds. In this case, they stayed the same. So now, these are the differences between the start value and the end value. So now, if I wanted to test whether or not this intervention had an effect, whether Weight Watchers worked, 
instead of looking at the average for the weight before and the average for the weight after, it's much more convenient to look at the weight, the differences of the weight for all of the people. So now, it, it, when I do that, now I can add up all these differences and I can get the average difference. In this case, what's it going to be? It's going to be you know, 20. These are going to cancel out. It's going to be uh, uh, 30 divided by uh, 5 is going to be the difference is minus. They lost an average of 6 pounds, minus 6. Right? Well, now I can calculate a standard deviation for these numbers as well. So I'm not going to calculate standard deviation. I'll make up a I'll make up a number. I'll call it like three or something like that. Right? That's a made up number. So standard deviation is equal to three. So now what I'm testing now is not sample A against sample B, but I'm testing whether or not the differences are different. The average difference, D with a bar on top, the average difference is different from zero. So now I can do my t test this way. T is equal to uh, the, the, the mean d minus zero over the standard error. And the standard error is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Right? Now, my t, my critical value of t for a sample of five, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be very high. Let's see what it because it's such a small sample. So my critical value of t for four degrees of freedom is 2.778. I'm going to round it off. Okay, my critical value of t is 2.78. It equals 2.78 for n equals 5, or 4 degrees of freedom. Okay, so now, what am I doing here? Well, it's that my t value for the this sample is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to the difference between the two, which is minus 6, divided by the standard error. The standard error is going to be equal to 3, divided by the square root of 5, right? I'm not going to calculate that. Whatever that number comes out to be, um, let's say it comes out to be 2, so the t value is equal to minus 3, right? Well, that says that I'm three standard errors away from uh, uh, the distance between <coughs> 0 and the sample I have is three standard errors. Well, what was the critical value of t that I, that I was worried about? 2.78. So, I would only get expect to get a difference that big less than 5% of the time. That's what that critical value of t tells us, right? So what was our null hypothesis? It was that d0, the, 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 the average difference equals 0, and our alternative was the average sample does not equal 0. So what happened here with this paired sample? This paired sample test turned into a single sample test. It's the same thing as a single sample test except the value that we're testing it against is that there's no difference, zero. So it's really the same as a single sample test. There's one more thing I want to show you. <clears throat> okay, and that's what happens when you deal with proportions. Okay, so if, if I want to do, if I take a single sample, if I know the proportion, uh, now let's say I know that the, um, the that a um, uh, that if you play um, uh, the <coughs> the um, uh, let, let's something that's a simple uh, uh, okay let's say um, I'm just gonna say uh, uh, a coin toss uh, the probability of getting heads when you toss a coin is going to be 0. 0.5 right now if I if somebody gives me a coin says you know this coin is this coin has been weighted. So you're going to get more heads than you get tails. It's a trick coin, right? If I want to test that, I would flip that coin. Let's say I flip it 100 times. I would flip that coin, and my expectation would, would be that I would get 50, head, 50 heads. Now, let's say I flip that coin, and I actually get uh, 45 heads instead of 50. Now, I say to myself, you know, I could have gotten 45 heads even with a regular coin. How likely it is, is it that I'm getting uh, – uh, let me make that 55 since I'm saying that I'm, I'm weighting it. Right? How likely is I get 55 if I toss it 100 times if there's no – if it isn't weighted, if it's a fair coin? Well, this 55 out of 100, that's our sample proportion. We put a cap on it to show that it's different than the population proportion that we're comparing it to. So that p cap is equal to 
0.55, 55 out of 100. Okay, so now if I want to know if it's different enough for me to say with 95% certainty, less than 5% chance of getting it wrong, that this coin is not, is weighted. So it's not really the real true proportion of heads that you get from, from this coin is not really 55. How would I do that? Well, I'm going to do that the same way I did before. I'm going to say T is equal to P cap minus P, right, over the uh, standard error for this distribution of what the distribution. If I took uh, uh, samples of 100 and flipped them many, many times, what would that, how would that be distributed? What standard error would I have there? Now, in this case, the standard error is going to be equal to the square root of P cap, right? We don't know P, so I would use P here if I knew it, but I don't know P. P cap times 1 minus P cap over the sample size. Okay, so I would calculate that, and that would be 0 0.55 times 0 0.45, right, times 0.45 over 100, and we would calculate that we'd wind up with a standard error, whatever that comes out to. I'm going to say, let's say the standard error is equal to uh, one, <clears throat> say the standard error is equal to, I'm going to, I'm going to say uh, four, right? Say the standard error is equal to four. So now I want to test whether or not that that kind of standard error variability in the samples is going to allow me to say that this coin is not 50%. Okay, so I'm going to compare it to 50%. So T is going to be equal to, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what well, we said, 0.55 minus 0.5. I'm sorry, for the standard error is equal to, point, it's a percentage that we're dealing with here. Standard error is equal to 0 0.04, 4%. Okay, that'll come out as a percentage. You'll see when it works out, it'll come out that way. So 0 0.55 minus uh, 0 0.45, P times one, uh, times, times one uh, excuse me, P minus 5. 0.50. Oh, let me do this again. P cap is 0.55 minus P, which is the population that we're comparing it to, 0.50 over the standard error. <coughs> now, standard error is equal to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 0.04. Okay, so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna uh, see the different difference here is going to be. 0.55 is going to be 0.05 divided by 0.04. And that's going to come out to be equal to 1.25. So my T-score is 1.25. Well, is that big enough for me to say that the difference? Well, now I need to know what the T critical value of T is. Well, in fact, when we work with proportions, we, work, we make sure we work with sample sizes that are large enough that typically we will use the z-score instead of the t-score. So in this case, I might say that the t-score, that, that the critical value of t, this is a pretty big sample size, 100, uh, that the critical value of t is equal to uh, 1.96, right? So is this 1.96 standard errors apart? No, it's not. So I can't say that I can't, I, I can't reject the idea that uh, 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 that the, uh, the the probability for our coin is equal to the probability of of a fair coin, right? So I can't say that that's not true because I don't have they're not far enough apart for me to say that with less than five percent chance of being wrong. So my null hypothesis is the p for the coin I have is equal to the probability for a fair coin. Okay, and my alternative would have been the probability for my coin is not equal to probability for a fair coin. In other words, it really is a bad coin, a fixed coin. <clears throat> I can't reject a null hypothesis because my t-score doesn't exceed my critical value of t. So what is this? This is basically a single sample t-test, but applied to proportions instead of a mean. Still a point value, but using a proportion as if it's the uh, middle value. <clears throat> now, this gets complicated there's a whole set of formulas now that you use when you're comparing population one, proportion one, to another sample from another group for its proportion. Like, for instance, if you were comparing the population 
the, the percentage of people that have, di- that have diabetes in um, uh, 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 among smokers versus the proportion of diabetes among non-smokers. So we randomly select smokers and get uh, get how many out of 100 that you have to get that proportion, and you might take a similar approach to non-smokers and then compare the two proportions. Except this time, when you compare, when you're comparing, you're comparing PCAP smokers minus PCAP non-smokers over the standard error for these two proportions. And there's a way, there's a bunch of formulas that I'll show you on a chart that you would apply in order to figure out what this T value is for two proportions, comparing two, the proportions of two groups. 0.12, okay, you guys are actually working out the numbers there. So I'm going so quickly here that I want to get bogged down with the numbers because I want to work on a couple of specific examples and maybe show you quickly on uh, SPSS how you might be working. Okay, so let me open up that sheet, which gives you these. So we have a few different ways of doing it, but that basically you have a roadmap here, don't you? You have a roadmap. First thing you have to say to yourself, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with, am I dealing with a single sample that I'm comparing to a, a, no, a known mean for some other group, right? That's a single sample t-test. Am I dealing with two samples, samples from two different groups, right? And in that case, I can go two different directions. I can assume the variances are the same. I can assume the variances are different. In practice, manually, you might assume that they're the same as long as they're not, one is not double what the other one is. More than double what the other one is, you would say that they're not equal, okay? And you would work it out that way. And then, so you have two ways to go there, uh, equal variance, unequal variance. When you use SPSS, SPSS actually does a calculation to help you evaluate whether you should use equal variance or not. Okay, and then when you work with proportions, you might be working, uh, excuse me, when you work with the paired samples, whole new ball game, right? When you work with paired samples, you're actually interested in the difference between each one of these uh, people. It's the same person. Uh, its values taken from the same uh, subject, and so on and so forth, and you're looking at only the differences. So it's only a single sample that you're comparing the average of the differences to zero. So it's basically the same rules as a single sample. And then finally, we have two ways that we might run into a uh, comparison of proportions. One is you're dealing with it as if it's a single sample. The other one is you're dealing with it as if it's two samples that you're comparing and the formulas are similar, but a little bit different. I'm going to open up that document right now so that we can look at those differences. Let me see if I can find this. <clears throat> Come on. Uh, let me, no, that's not what I want to do. Let me get some of this stuff out of the way. <clears throat> okay, I think it might be in here. Okay. Okay, can't do This is extra is what I put it. That's not the one. Okay, okay. Not in there. Whether you're here. There you go. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Oh man, there's all these weird folders here. Tonight. <clears throat> nope. Let's see. Now, you know, I'm going to go to Blackboard and find it. You guys probably have seen this, right? You, you, when we, I posted them with the lab. I believe I posted them. I hope I did. Yeah, here we go. It is, the one I'm talking about is um, um, T-test variations. Okay, so here we go. So, now, what if you have two samples? Well, I, you know, I didn't put single sample test. I guess I didn't put single sample tests here because they're pretty simple, right? So if you compare the means of two populations, right, how do you, how, first of all, you state your null and alternative hypothesis. 
And that's almost always going to be mu1 is equal to mu2. You can make the scribe a little bit better. Uh, and the alternative is going to be mu1 is not equal to mu2. And you want to determine your level of confidence, which is alpha. Okay, how big a, how big a chance of being wrong when you reject the null hypothesis are you, do you want to be? And that's almost always going to be 5%. Occasionally, it'll be 1% chance of being wrong. Alpha equals 1%. In that case, when you go to the T table, use the column for 99% confidence, not 95% confidence. Okay, so what do you need to know? Uh, you take your samples, you take your two samples, you know your sample size, you know your, uh, uh, the means of the two samples, and two sample sizes, you got two means, two sample sizes, and then you need to determine your standard error. Well, where's the standard error? The standard error is down here. There's the standard error down there. <clears throat> the T-score for the difference between the two means is going to be equal to the difference between the two means divided by the standard error, which is down here. Well, if you have equal variances, you're going to you're going to first calculate a single pooled standard deviation, right? Using this formula, pooled standard deviation is equal to uh, 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 the sample size one minus one times standard deviation of group one squared plus the stand the sample size two minus one times standard deviation of sample size two squared. And you're going to divide that by the sum of the two sample sizes minus two, basically like degrees of freedom, okay? <clears throat> and you're going to take the square root of that whole thing. Now that you have a single pooled standard deviation, you still, still have two, two different sample sizes. So what you're going to do then is you're going to say <clears throat> that the T-scored standard error is equal to the pooled standard deviation, which you got from here, times the square root of 1 over the sample size plus one uh, sample size 1 plus 1 over sample size 2. You'll calculate this and then divide it into the difference to get a number. Now, that number t, you're going to have to compare it to the critical value of t. So what's the critical value of t in this case? Well, if you're going to assume equal variances, the spot in the t-chart where you look up the t critical value of t is n1 plus n2, the sum of two sample sizes, minus 2. And you use that as your degrees of freedom. You compare the t value, the critical value of t, and if your t value that you calculated here is bigger than the critical value that you need from the table, you reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. If it's not, you haven't proved anything about the, the null hypothesis. You don't say you accept the null hypothesis. You just say you failed to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so I hope that helps <coughs> clarify it a bit. Now, what if you're, you're, you look at your standard deviations and they're quite different, and you don't want to assume that they're equal. Okay, again, like say one is more than twice the other. The, uh, you stand deviation for your two samples. So in that case, you do you do the same thing when you know alternative hypothesis. Your level of confidence is still going to be the same. Your critical value of t is is going to be based on the sample sizes, the relative sample sizes. And we're going to calculate that in a second. Okay, so in this case, unequal variances. We're going to Take the difference between the two means. Nothing changes there. Except this time, our standard error is calculated based on, uh, it's kind of a weighted average, kind of based on <clears throat> our standard deviation for group one squared and standard deviation for group two divided by each of their sample sizes added together and then find the square root. So you can take this standard error, divide it into the difference between the two, get a t-value. Okay, so now you need to go to the t-table to find out where your critical value of t to see if your value that you calculate is bigger than that so you can reject the null hypothesis. Well, a little bit of a problem. The actual calculation of degrees of freedom when you use this method, unequal variances, gets pretty complicated. So you have two choices here. One choice is to say, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to calculate this out and waste about 20 minutes on the test to try and decide whether or not I can reject the null hypothesis. The other thing you might want to do is just say, you know, I know it's not going to be smaller than the, the smaller sample size. So I'm just going to say, for degrees of freedom, instead of calculating this for initial purposes. For, now, SPSS will actually calculate this. <coughs> but if you're doing it manually with Excel or with a calculator, I would say that for initial purposes, just to test if you really can reject the null hypothesis, 
right? You can say that <clears throat> that the degrees of freedom is equal to the smaller sample size minus one of the two groups, smaller sample size two groups minus one. That's a very conservative estimate. So if you can reject the null hypothesis based on that assumption, you know you'll be able to. If you you would for sure be able to reject it. If uh, <clears throat> you you for sure would be able to reject it. Um, uh, if you calculated this out, if you don't can't reject the null hypothesis and it's close, you might want to go back and actually calculate this out or use SPSS to to uh, solve it to see if it's close enough. But I mean, really close. Okay, so so um, uh, uh, and this works best when the uh, uh, smaller sample happens to have a larger standard deviation. But for what it's worth. Uh, that's typically the way you might handle it uh, uh, and when you have a limited amount of time, like on a test. What's the next situation you might get into? Well, when you're comparing two population proportions. Okay, we saw what you did when you, you when you had a single proportion. You're comparing it to a known proportion, known population proportion. That's the same kind of as a single sample t-test. Well, what about if you have you comparing two population proportions, two different samples, right? <clears throat> The samples have to be uh, has to be at least thirty, with at least fifteen in each outcome. In other words, yeses and noes. So, in other words, if you had thirty people um, and you were testing diabetes, and only three out of the thirty had diabetes, that wouldn't work for you. You need to have both groups. So, it's, if it, you know, if it's only if only ten percent of the people have diabetes, you would need at least fifteen people that have diabetes, right? So, you would probably have to have a sample size of at least one hundred and fifty or larger. That's why one. Of, that's one of the reasons why we're often working with very large sample sizes. Okay, so now how would you uh, how would you do this? Well, now <clears throat> what you would do is it's the same deal. You want to calculate uh, uh, you, know, you see here because now because of large sample size probably just be using one point nine six, right? So we would find the difference between the two proportions, and then we would find the square root of the <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the square root of the, you know, this is an old version of this. I think I might have might have corrected this. P one times the that of the sample. Okay, calculate the, calculate. I think this should be the pooled proportion. This this in here is the pooled proportion, not P cap. Yeah, see, it's there's no one or two underneath it. No one or two. P one and P two are the proportions of the Two groups, excuse me, <clears throat> P1 is a proportion of group one, P2 is a proportion of group two. You find the difference between them. And the standard error down here is based on a pooled uh, population proportion. Uh, P cap one, your calculated proportion times the sample size. P cap two times its sample size divided over the sum of the two samples. That gives you a pooled population proportion. Right, like it might be uh, 0.1 times 100, and point, <clears throat> uh, 0.2 uh, times uh, 50, whatever it happens to be, divided over 150. Right, so you calculate a pooled population proportion from this formula. You put that down here, where you got the p cap without the numbers in. That's really the pooled proportion, right? That number there, right? So you put that down there. And you have your sample size, you just fill this in, calculate your standard error first, divide it into the difference, and then you see if your z score that you get, the number of standard deviations, standard errors apart, if that z score is greater than the critical value of z. And we know for we're working with z instead of t, that critical value is 1.96. Okay, for five percent. For one percent, that p value is point is two point five eight. For 10%, alpha is equal to 10%. You're willing to accept 10% chance of being wrong. It's 1.64. And where's that, that those resources come from? They come from the normal distribution we did a long time ago. Okay, so that's how you would deal with different kinds of situations where this is concerned. Okay, so what I would suggest you guys do at this stage is start looking at specific examples. Uh, I don't know what that means, so I'll put that away. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm going to just quickly run through this with you. Let's take a look at this. Now, there's a lot of stuff in here that is going to bring back bad memories. I realize that. 
but you do have to review some stuff from the, from, from the uh, uh, primarily the test is going to be the material we covered since the last test. But that covers a lot of ground. That covers confidence intervals. It covers T tests and so on and so forth. So, so you want to you want to go back and look over those powerpoints, but you also don't want to have amnesia where the earliest stuff is concerned. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Time magazine quoted a poll performed in 2002 in which four percent of Americans said they were vegetarian. Construct a 95 percent confidence interval for the true population of vegetarians. Uh, interpret these confidence interval. Uh, 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 in interpreting, you can, you can conclude that few in person. Can you conclude? Well, that's kind of a one single sample t-test, right? You want to know if it's outside of that confidence interval, right? How are you going to calculate a confidence interval? Well, you got 4%, right? So you know what p-cap is. It's a very large sample, so you're going to use z, right? So 4%, right? So what is our standard error there? It's going to be, it's going to be let's see, standard error is going to be 0.4. It's going to be p times 1 minus p over the sample size, and take the square root of the whole thing, that's going to be our standard error. And we're going to multiply that by 1.96 and add that to 4% and subtract it from 4% to get that range. And if 10% is outside of that range, then we will say that we're 95% sure that Ameri that uh, that is the, that's different than 10%. Okay, so, and you might wind up with some problems here where we walk into a situation, it's more confidence interval, so we can get something that involves t-test. Uh, da -da. Okay. Uh, again, this is single sample, so it's a little boring. Okay. <clears throat> Management claims. You have, by the way, you have you have solutions for these as well. There's a sheet with solutions. If you email me, if you have a specific problem that that we have here, I'm going to post this so that everybody can see at the session that we just have. If you have a specific problem from these practice e examples, email me and Sunday night. Uh, I think I put the time up. I don't remember what time it was. Sunday night, I'll do another half hour, and I'll go over specific problems that people email me that they have an issue with. Okay, so so um, 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 there's some exercises from the textbook. Let's see if I can find some specific examples. Okay, that you can go through all this stuff. Let me see if I got a little t test here. Problem five: Survey is taken about that public housing for random sample of twenty-nine families, sample size twenty-nine, annual incomes as such. Construct a box plot. Uh, yeah, we can put that in next. Okay. Well, you know, let me uh, let me just quickly do something with SPSS, just so because I know someone had some issues with it, and. Okay, and I want to open up Excel too. I want to address a particular problem someone had with Excel. Okay, cancel. Okay, so now. We have, one of the things that we did in, uh, during class is we took an example where we had <clears throat> two groups that we were comparing, whatever these, maybe these are test scores, who knows what they might be. We were looking at these two groups, right? So one of the things that we did was we said, if we're going to calculate this manually, we are going to say, okay, well, let's, what, are the, what are the means of these two groups? In other words, X bar, X bar for females, X bar for males, going to be equal to the average of these two groups. And I'm going to copy this over. Okay, so there's a difference in the average of these two groups. Okay, so this average this group is 10, this average group. So what else do we need to know to compare these two groups? I need to know the standard deviation of each group. Okay, so the standard deviation of this group is going to be equal to And the standard deviation of the other group is going to be equal to one. Now, they're less than, this one is less than twice what the other one is. So in this case, I'm going to say to myself <coughs> that I'm going to use the equal variances version of our calculation. 
Okay, the sample size in both cases happens to be nine, right? No big deal, right? So how what do we need to know? To, how are we going to determine whether or not the val the average value the average values for the populations of males is equal to va uh, average value of the population of females? The first thing we do is we set up our null hypothesis. The mean for males is equal to the mean for females. That's our null hypothesis. What's our alternative hypothesis? The mean for males does not equal the mean for females. Right? Okay, that's our null hypothesis. Well, now, in order to figure this out, I have to find, see, it's a small sample size, so I'm going to be using the T. Right? So the first thing I need to know is, how am I going to calculate T? Well, T <coughs> is going to be equal to the difference in the two means, two samples now, right? X bar, uh, X bar males, minus X bar females, divided by this whole thing. I'm going to put parentheses around it so that we know it's divided. No, it's, that's, that's the top of our equation, right? Divided, oops, divided by, uh, okay, divided by, uh, the standard error. Okay, that's what's going to give me my t score. Well, x bar minus x bar, x bar males, right? That's easy enough. 10 minus that, right? No big deal. What about the bottom part of this, the standard error? What is the standard error going to be equal to? Well, since these two vary, these two values are, are, uh, since these two values are, uh, uh, <coughs> are, Close enough, I'm going to use the rules for equal variances. Right? So, how did we calculate that? Well, the first thing we had to do was calculate a pooled standard deviation. Right? Standard deviation pool. We needed to calculate that before we could go any further. Right? So, how was that done? Let me see if I still got that document open. Do I have that document open still? I have to close it. Right? Nope, I guess I closed it. Let me see if I can get the word. Uh, what's the password? Nope, that's not what I wanted. I don't understand why I, how I could have lost it. <clears throat> Maybe it's in my... Okay, let me go back. There it is. Oh, I didn't really download it. It was in the store. So how am I going to do that? It's going to be equal to N1, 9, minus 1 is 8, times standard deviation 1, which was... Uh, standard deviation one, which was 10 squared plus 8 times, uh, I'm sorry, 2.7 squared plus 8 times 1.94 squared divided by 18 minus 2 or 16. Find the square root of that. That gives me my pooled standard deviation. And then to complete the bottom part of that, I'm going to take that value I calculated and multiply it by the square root of 1 over 9 plus 1 over 9. Add those two together, find the square root, multiply it by the value I got from here. That gives me the bottom part of this. I, multi I divide it into the top part of this. Okay, That gives me my t value. Now I have to figure out, is that big enough for me to reject my null hypothesis, that t value? In order to do that, I have to go to the chart and look up what my critical value of t is. Right? Well, how do I get my, my, my critical value of t? Well, i got to know my degrees of freedom. So my degrees of freedom going to be equal to 8, uh, excuse me, 9 plus 9 is 18, minus 2 is 16. So I can go to my t-table now, and I can look up for 16 degrees of freedom. I have to exceed the value, critical value t of 2.12 in order to reject my null hypothesis and accept my alternative hypothesis. If the t-value I calculate is not bigger than 2.12, I fail to reject my null hypothesis.
well, how would this work if I were working with uh, SPSS? I'm going to copy these numbers. Now, if I go to SPSS and I just go over there and I just paste these numbers in here, okay? And I think it was the first one, males or females. I think I actually got this wrong. I got them, I reversed them when I did this uh, in class, I think. Um, uh, I'm going to go to the variable view. And the first one is males. See, so it assigned it a name automatically. I'm going to call that males. This is going to be females. Okay. And I want to make sure that it understands that these are, that these are scalar values, that these are numbers. Okay. okay. So I'm going to go back here. Okay. So here I am. I got males and females. I got a problem here. SPSS does not look at this. In Excel, I could say, oh, males and females, let's compare the two of them. SPSS does not work that way. The way SPSS likes to work is it likes to have a variable which has a value, for instance, gender. So in it wants one column to represent the gender. And you can either type in male, female, male, female, or you can more often substitute for it by putting, say, one for male, two for female, one for male, two for female, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so it wants to deal with the, the variable gender in one column and the variable, whatever the score was, in the other column. So I'm going to fix this so that that's going to work. Okay, so now the way I'm going to fix it is I'm going to take these values and I'm going to put them down here. Right? So now those values are not male or female. Those values represent that those values represent the gender, excuse me, represent the score. Let's say it's a test. They represent the score, right? So here we go. That These numbers now, are, this whole column represents the score. Now, I happen to know that the top nine values are males and the bottom nine values are females here because I just, that's the way I, I pasted them in there. So I'm going to go back here now and I'm going to tell you, you know, this column now, this column is going to represent this second column is going to represent gender. And for our purposes, I'm going to go now. Gender is a nominal value. And now with nominal values, I can tell SPSS in here that one represents male and two represents female. Whoops. That two represents female. And then I add that and I say, okay. So now... SPSS knows what the one and two represent in that second column. And it knows that second column is going to be gender. So now I have to tell it. So I'm going to put a one, a one. Now watch this. I'm going to change this. I'm going to make it show the values. Okay. I'm going to put a one. Whoops. And it lets me choose if I want to, whether that's male or female. Okay. So I'm going to turn that off because it's going to get annoying as I go down. Right. So it gives you a little help. And I'm going to put in all ones for the first nine values because they're all males. Then I'm going to put all twos for the second nine values. So when you're really collecting data, when you're really putting together SPSS, you wouldn't have started the way I did with these two columns. This is the way you would have organized your data right from the start. So where, uh, I, I, was a, I don't remember who asked me about this. But see, so that's the way SPSS organizes data. The only time that SPSS wants two groups alongside of each other is when, now get this, this is, this is going to be interesting. It's going to be when we're comparing, um, um, uh, 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 we're, we're comparing, um, uh, excuse me, I'm having a senior moment here. When we're comparing measurements from the same subject or the same person, in other words, paired samples. So if we were doing our weight thing before, we would put before in one column, after in another column, Okay, and now when I go back, uh, before and after, I would put in, oh, this person weighed 120 pounds before, and they weighed 110 pounds after, and then I would organize my, in that case, where I'm using paired samples, that's the way I would organize it for, for uh, paired samples. But normally, SPSS wants these uh, 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 variable, each column representing a different variable. In this case, oh, let me just do one, a couple more numbers here, just so I can show you. 130, 125, uh, 130, 
110, 140, 145, and 150, and no change on this one. That's it. Okay, these I'll put those side by side. Okay, so let's go up and do some, some analyses here. I'm going to say analyze. Now, I want to compare means. You know, my version of this can get pretty annoying here. <clears throat> uh, actually, I think I'm okay here. Let's see. So what I want to compare is these two different groups. Um, you know, I, I, uh, uh, um, I want to show you another. If I do this, if I do an analysis, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Hang on a second here. Um, I'm going to compare means independent samples t tests. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to say okay the variable the thing I'm finding the mean of is the score. I'm comparing the mean scores, right? And how am I breaking up my groups? My groups are broken up by gender, by sex, male and female. Now SPSS is going to ask me well, what numbers represent genders over here. What numbers should I be looking for? And the reason why it does that is because in this case, it can only be ones and twos because it's male and females, but you could have a situation where, for instance, it might be ethnicities. So one might be um, uh, uh, Puerto Rican, one might be Hispanic, one might be white, one might be black, one might be non-Hispanic black, and so on and so forth. So you can have many different numbers, right? So it wants to know which of the two groups to compare. So uh, it, it always asks you, even though there's only two and it should be able to figure it out, <clears throat> it will always ask you. i got to put in one and two in there. And I'll click OK. So now an output window comes up. And that output window tells me it calculates a T-score for me, right? And what do I need to know? Well, I need to compare that T-score. Remember, these are, these are uh, <clears throat> assuming equal variances. My T-score comes out to be 2.18. Okay, now what's my critical value of T for uh, 16 degrees of freedom? Remember, that's for, for equal variances. We just add them together to subtract 2 to 16. It's 2.12. Did we exceed 2.12? Uh, yes, we did. So we can reject our null hypothesis and say that the two means are different from one another. Okay, so now I'm going to take a closer look at that in a second. Um, so, so SPSS does the calculation for the T-score for me. It calculates standard error. It calculates the difference in the means, the whole nine yards. does everything for you. Okay, so now I just wanted to point out to you that, that on my version of SPSS, when I have the output window open, and I do exactly the same thing, analyze, compare means, I get more choices now. I can do a one sample t-test, an independent sample t-test. Uh, remember, at one sample, we're comparing it to a certain number. So here, I just got to tell it, oh, move score in there to find the mean. And what do I want to compare? I want to know if the score was different than 12, let's say. And it, uh, and it will do that calculation, comparing the sample, uh, from getting a t-score for the difference between our average score and another population where I know the, the mean for the whole population was 12, a single sample t-test. Okay, so let's go back to the test we just did. Here you see a single sample t-test compared to 12, but it actually did it. Let's take a look at the example I just did where I compared the two means. Oops, whoops. Okay, let's, oh, yeek, yeek. Let me go back to SPSS if I can. Yeah, there we go. I'll do it this way. Get our output window up. Okay, so now let's take a look at what we have here. The first thing that SPSS does is it does a calculation for mean, standard deviation into two groups, the sample size, standard error, everything that it needs to calculate the T-score, just like you would do. Okay, then it actually calculates the T-score. The calculation of the T-score is over here to the right, T-test for equality and the mean. It's over here, right? So in this box over here, it does a different process. It compares to see whether the variances, the standard deviations, are different enough that you should do the calculation for equal variances not assumed, right? Or you should do the calculation for equal variances are assumed. Well, remember we said that since um, uh, this standard deviation was not, that they weren't like one wasn't twice what the other was, that we're going to assume that close enough to say they're equal, right? Well, it does exactly the same thing, except it does a statistical test for it. Okay, and this statistical test is called, it's hard for me to get this to balance. It's called Levine's test for the equality of the variances. And it calculates a statistic, and that statistic has a probability that goes with it, a p-value. The SPSS calls that significance. 
that p-value is 0.24. So now, our null hypothesis, our starting point, is that the, that the variances of these two groups are equal. And we're only going to reject that idea if the probability of being wrong is less than 5%. Now, the probability of wrong is being is 24.5%, 0.24. So since this is less than uh, this is not less than 0.05, we stick with we fail to reject equal variances. So we stick with the top row. So our t test comes out 1.84. Had this had these been more uh, uh, had this had these been a greater difference between the two of these things, this might have come out to be a number less than 0.05. In that case, we would reject this idea and use the bottom number the bottom row. This bottom row is the result that we would have gotten if we had done this calculation uh, uh, using the formulas for unequal variances. And we get, uh, as it happens, in this case, we get the value 2.184. And then we get the degrees of freedom calculated. Oh, you guys remember that the, comp the formula for degrees of freedom with equal variances was very simple. It was the sum of the two sample sizes, 18 minus 2, 16. Very simple calculation. But for unequal variances, the, t, the degrees of freedom is very complicated formula. And you can see it here. It comes out to that number if you actually worked it out. Well, that's very interesting. So what does that mean to us? Well, that means to us that what that means is, is that uh, my degrees of freedom, the critical value of t that I should be using to compare these means are different than the critical value if I had used uh, equal variances. So uh, even though the T-scores came out uh, different, there's an advantage to using equal variance. I had an advantage by pooling the uh, standard deviations, right? So, so we'll, let's see what this means to us. This means to us that had we used the bottom row, the probability of being wrong, and that's displayed here in significance, right? Uh, uh, Two-tailed significance, which means the probability of being wrong, being uh, uh, different than your alpha, Probability of being wrong was 4%, 4.4% for equal variances assumed, and 4.6% for equal variances unassumed. They both, since they're both less than 5%, in both cases you reject the null hypothesis. Okay, and in, in fact, both cases they exceed their critical values of t for either 14 degrees of freedom uh, and or for 16 degrees of freedom. Now, in our example, we probably would have used nine degrees of freedom um, uh, instead of uh, uh, calculating this. And uh, it would have been kind of a crapshoot on whether we would have re rejected the null hypothesis. In that case, to be honest, it would have been a close call, right? So we might have actually, you know, so in that case, it might have been but calculated. But again, on a test, I don't think we'd make the, the, we'll make the outcome that close that it would make a difference. Okay, so I think I think we should call it call it a day. So again, if you guys if you have specific examples that you would like me to go over, right? If you have specific examples that you would like me to go over, right? And uh, please email them to me, like from the homework or from uh, <clears throat> or from these examples. You do have the solutions, like you know, but a lot of times just looking at the solution can be. Uh, it can help to have it explained as well. So anything that you have that you want me to go over, uh, uh, check out Blackboard, and we'll be on for about a half hour. We're going to do a quick session just to go over some loose ends uh, tomorrow night. Now, I'm going to post this session. I'm also going to post a similar session that I did with the uh, with another class. So if you want, you could, uh, if you're gluttons for punishment, you can listen to me for <laughs> two hours instead of one hour. So... Have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. And study hard. Do well on the test. And crack those homeworks. Take care.